All right, that was a courtesy 30 seconds. We're gonna get going. Um, seems like we've got a, a good capacity here. So again, thank you. Welcome to today's webinar, What Happens When the E Stands for Enforcement. I'm Michelle Bodian, a senior associate attorney at the law firm Vicente Cedarberg and co-chair of our EHS practice group. Just wanna tell you a little bit about VS and a little bit about specifically our EHS practice group that's newly launched in the past couple months. Very excited about this practice group and my co-chair Mark Ross is on as well. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about us and then I'm gonna hand it over to each of our esteemed co-panelists today to talk a little bit about who they are and um, why we drag them to today's webinar. So appreciate you joining us. So VS, national law firm, 100% focused on cannabis clients. That's all we serve every day. Though I should add a little small percentage now these days of Ethogen's practice, but you know, cannabis meaning both hemp and marijuana, those are the clients we serve. F founded about a little over 10 years ago out of Colorado. Um, our founding partner is instrumental in legalizing adult use in Colorado. We've grown quite large these days. We've got uh, offices in seven states throughout the country. And again, say the word cannabis one more time, 100% cannabis focused. Um, and then Mark and I are very proud to have launched our EHS practice group within the firm. Um, and he's gonna talk a lot more detail about what is EHS, but wanted to give just a little bit of background of EHS within the firm. Um, so obviously the acronym there standing for Environment, Health and Safety. And we do have a number, myself, Mark, as well as supported by you know a full team here of attorneys, compliance specialists, regulatory specialists who do have experience and have previous experience operating um, and advising clients um, in the private and public sector on environmental health and safety. So environmental spills and releases, you know, health, airborne, um, potential airborne issues or safety when we're talking about um, anything that can cause injury to your workers, such as, you know, moving machinery, forklifts, uh, really focusing in there on OSHA. So our EHS practice, you know, combined experience here at VIAS more than 50 years, experienced in the environmental field and excited to bring this knowledge to the cannabis industry. So I'm going to first hand it over to Mark um, to give a little introduction to himself. And again, Michelle Bodian. Um, I, I was formerly with Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resource before that with a private law firm doing environmental law as well. So that's a little bit of my background and Mark kicking it over to you. Thanks, Michelle. So I'm Mark Ross. Uh, I am the co-chair of the EHS practice here at Vicente Cedarberg. I'm also the head of impact and ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance, uh, that practice at the law firm as well. I've been an environmental attorney uh, nearly 30 years, worked in the public sector, cut my teeth as an environmental regulator and uh, litigator for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection before going into the private sector. Uh, and then into the nonprofit sector, and then pivoting my career into corporate responsibility and ES and G. And so uh, that's really my background. Uh, I'm real excited that I get to uh, take the combination of my experience from the beginning of my career through my career and, and now into the cannabis sector to work on these emerging issues in the space. Great. And since you're in Colorado, I'll hand it over to Jeff, who's also in Colorado. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Lawrence. I'm the director of the Division of Environmental Health and Sustainability at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. I'm a graduate of Colorado State University, have a degree in um, immunology or microbiology and uh, medical immunology, along with environmental health. Um, I've been at the department my entire career, 29 years in a variety of different roles. My current role as the director of Division of Environmental Health, I've been in for 12 years. Um, our division oversees a variety of tasks from environmental toxicology and environmental impact assessments to sustainable practices, non-regulatory programs focused on waste diversion activities and greening business and greening government, institutional health and childcare schools and um, correctional facilities, and then the food sector from really farm to table. And that's really how we're involved with hemp and in Colorado is the manufacturing sector of um, making industrial hemp products. Thanks. Great, thank you. And then handing it over to Lou to introduce himself. Hi, I'm uh, Lou Dundon. I'm Senior Enforcement Counsel in the Environmental Protection Division at the Massachusetts Office of the Attorney General. I've been here for about 15 years now as Assistant Attorney General and um, 
Uh, my focus has been largely on state level enforcement work, also uh, to, to a decent share of uh, state level permitting appeals, things of that nature, environmental permitting appeals, defending uh, the agency. Um, and uh, prior to that, I spent a couple of years clerking at the uh, Massachusetts Court of Appeals. Great, thank you so much, everyone. So just a little overview of what, you know, what you're gonna hear about today. Obviously, you just heard from our everyone who's going to be speaking. So pretty good group here today, that I think. That'll be giving you an overview of what's going on in EHS and talking about cannabis. So we'll get in a little bit more detail. We'll hear from Mark as to what is truly EHS. What are we talking about here? And then we're going to jump in. Uh, Mark and I are going to split up what sort of enforcement actions have we been seeing affecting the cannabis industry to date, which is you know a pretty good predictor of what might be coming. Then we want to flip it over to our state regulators and hear from them, the ones that are actually on the ground enforcing this, what type of enforcement actions have they seen, what's going on from the state perspective. And then we're going to move into some tips and tricks of you know, how not to get on their radar, um, how to avoid any sort of environmental orders or penalties. And last, we are going to leave time for questions at the end. Um, and then if you're burning to watch this again, this all will be posted on YouTube uh, for future reference. We don't have a ton of slides today. We're just going to be having more of a casual conversation and we're going to pop off so you don't need to stare at our faces um, while one person is talking over the other. So with that overview and introduction, we're all going to pop off and hand it over to Mark to start with just a brief overview of, as the slide says, what is EHS? Thanks, Michelle. So what is EHS? Uh, well, we already know that it's E. The E is for environment. So generally, uh, a number of environmental laws apply to the cannabis industry, cannabis being cannabis and hemp, same plant, different name. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second. H being health, generally referring to the health of employees, uh, mostly under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Act, OSHA, um, but can also be applied to other environmental transgressions, such as improper storage of hazardous waste. And then uh, safety, again, generally referring to the safety of employees, um, but could also be applied to safety in the community. So here we're talking about accidents, near misses, um, OSHA violations, and also um, uh, informing communities uh, under emergency planning requirements under EPCRA. Um, and I'll get to the whole alphabet soup of, of environmental laws and, and safety laws that apply now. Uh, but that's generally what EHS is. So the laws that generally apply to cannabis operations uh, fall under the, these categories. Uh, the Clean Water Act being one, generally applies to discharges to streams into publicly owned treatment works. Let's just, I'm gonna hit these at the 10,000 foot level. These are gonna be really general descriptions of really complex and nuanced laws. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, generally applies to uh, well water facilities uh, over a certain number of employees, uh, as well as um, injection wells for discharge and disposal of waste. Uh, the Clean Air Act, emissions from operations, uh, whether they be out of a pipe or just uh, fugitive emissions, odor control uh, often comes into play, VOC emissions from extraction facilities, uh, volatile organic compounds that is. Uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RECRA, generally applies to waste, municipal, universal, hazardous, storage, transportation, documentation, Etc. cetera, generation. Uh, the Comprehensive Environmental Resource Compensation and Liability Act, otherwise known as CERCLA, otherwise known as Superfund, generally applies to uh, remediation and um, hazardous conditions on sites, often plays a part in real estate issues in cannabis. Uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, say that 10 times fast, uh, applies generally to pesticides and cultivation facilities, um, as well as fungicides and rodenticides that may also appear in those operations. Um, Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA, again, toxic substances and operations. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, we already talked a little bit about OSHA. Um, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, that's EPCRA, so those are generally for facilities that have hazardous materials and what your plan is to let the community know if there's a release of those materials. Uh, and then there are, of course, um, state laws that could apply to a cannabis company, such as Prop 65 in California. Uh, 
A number of these acts, I should add, also have citizen suit provisions. So the enforcement may not necessarily come from one of the two gentlemen that are speaking today uh, or their colleagues in their agencies. It can actually come from citizens. Um, so citizens can enforce provisions of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, the Endangered Species Act, RECRA, CERCLA, EPCRA. And so um, if there are citizens in your community that do not like your operation and you are not in compliance, i.e. you don't have the necessary permits uh, or they get wind of shenanigans going on in your facility, they can also bring a lawsuit um, with the same penalty provisions in those acts, which are quite significant as we'll talk about in a few minutes. Lastly, the agencies that generally enforce these acts besides the citizens, uh, you've got the federal EPA as well as state EPA uh, or EPAs or Departments of Protection or Departments of Conservation. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, which generally deals with wetlands and uh, stream diversions. Uh, OSHA, which deals with those safety and health issues that we just discussed. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and state Fish and Wildlife Services as well have been known to enforce these laws generally with regard to stream diversions and pollution within stream channels. State and local health departments, um, can also uh, enforce these provisions around health and safety. Food and Drug Administration uh, can come in and enforce issues around uh, food safety. And then, of course, with regard to illegal operators, there are other agencies out there, such as, I mean, often illegal operations happen on public land. So you've got the National Forest Service, you've got um, the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies like that. So that is an overview of environmental health and safety. Michelle. Quite impressed you fit that all in in the, uh, the allotted five minutes. So obviously a lot more to get into there, but today we're drilling down uh, on enforcement actions. And so just wanted to highlight a few and then we can turn it over um, to our colleagues from the state to talk about you know, how to avoid one of these actions. So I'm just gonna drill in on two from Massachusetts and then Mark will talk about a few himself, just some brief highlights. So in Massachusetts, um, the State Environmental Regulatory Agency, Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, so that's regional office, so central office in June of 2021 did assess an $18,000 penalty against a cannabis, meaning marijuana operator for violations related to the air emission, storage of hazardous waste, and industrial wastewater. So just to kind of walk that back of exactly what was going on that resulted in this penalty, it was related to some industrial wastewater holding tank. It did not, this operator did not have an air quality permit related to VOC emissions from processing, so processing cannabis. And then there also was no air permit for certification for an emergency power diesel generator. So under the cannabis regulations, you know, some requirements to make sure there is a continuous power source. But in this case, um, presumably an oversight will give the deference there to the operator and that there was no um, air permit for this diesel generator. Also, a couple other um, violations related to disposing of hazardous waste. So in this case, ethanol cleaning solution. Um, so really important there just to know what is hazardous to know how you should and should not be disposing of it. So in this case, disposing of that ethanol cleaning solution down a drain without a water permit, um, as well as improperly storing hazardous waste. Again, in this case, the hazardous waste being ethanol, which is not always thought about in your day-to-day -day practice as a hazardous waste. Um, and then again, generating some hazardous waste without a license or registration. So all of that in the aggregate resulted in a civil penalty of $18,000. And this was pretty recent just from the over, over the summer here in Massachusetts. Um, and then a little bit older, more than a year ago, um, you know, the original pesticide violation started in June of 2020. 2019, they, um, what started the process, but ultimately resulted in a fine to two companies in June 2020. Um, so this is misuse of a pesticide in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, no pesticides have been approved um, for use on marijuana during the growing process at any time throughout the process. So in those cases, they found there were some falsifications of documents to conceal the use of pesticides. And in those cases, two different companies, Garden Remedies and Healthy Farms, those penalties were $200,000 and $350,000 in monetary penalties, as well as a couple other conditions that came 
with those. So those are the two more or less recent Massachusetts EHS related enforcement. And then I'll, I'll hand it back to Mark to talk a little bit about a couple other cases. And then we'll start hearing from Jeff and Lou from Colorado, Massachusetts. Thanks, Michelle. So I'm going to hit on a few. Um, well Greens uh, is was a San Diego is a San Diego extractor. Uh, they were found to have, and this again, this was June of this year, so just a few months ago, where they ended up getting assessed these penalties. They dumped a 55 gallon drum of ethanol waste off site. They were charged with hazardous waste storage and transportation violations. Company pled guilty in June. Um, to pay a $45,000 fine plus uh, $26,500 in restitution for the cleanup itself. The owner himself then also faces up to two years in jail and at least another five, or at least another $250,000 in penalties, while the company also faces an additional $500,000 in penalties. And then for the poor person that went and did the dumping, uh, the contractor, they face up to one year in jail and a fine in excess of $50,000. So we're talking about real world consequences, real dollars, and uh, life and liberty at stake for these very simple violations. Uh, another one I'll hit on, this was an illegal operator in Calaveras, California, where the, it had an innocent landowner. The landowner did not know what was going on in their property, supposedly, at least that's what the court found and the judge found. I assume that there was evidence supporting that. And this, was, this was in May of 2020. Um, but it resulted in, um, it, was, it was for civil penalties under the Fish and Game Code for envir environmental violations, water diversions, waste near waterways, banned pesticide usage. It resulted for the innocent landowner, $680,000 in penalties. Turning back um, to some more uh, legal operators in the last several months, uh, this one made a, a big amount of news. It was uh, three Oregon hemp operators, um, legal operators being sued by 17 migrant workers for various health and safety violations. They were um, working without lunch breaks or any other rest breaks, unreasonable lodging. I think there were uh, a number of them, 17 of them all jammed into, un, into empty houses, unsafe houses without running water, uh, sharing a portable toilet, uh, et cetera. Um, they, um, that still is in process. Um, because the migrant workers actually directly sued the company. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. So you do have to worry about your employees also bringing actions. Two other more recent ones, um, a legal operator, Santa Barbara County called uh, 805 Agricultural Holdings, uh, busted under, again, under fish and game code violations for stream pollution and pesticide usage, removal of vegetation from the stream, grading a road through the stream, construction of the cultivation hoop houses in the stream bed, uh, polluting the stream with diesel, pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, fertilizers, and piping. Uh, they received a $40,000 penalty. Uh, and last, in Sutter County, uh, again, California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, this was a hemp operation where the hemp operator was caught using um, uh, pesticides that were not approved for hemp, uh, and it resulted in the destruction of 22 acres of crop. So a significant loss for that operator for not complying with pesticide regulations. So that gives you a flavor for what's out there right now, just in the last you know, two years. Thanks, Mark. Now that we uh, got into a little bit of that uh, doom and gloom summary, we'd like to turn it over to Jeff and Lou to hear a bit from them about you know, what they're seeing from the state's perspective. Um, Jeff, if I can turn it to you to specifically talk about the food space and your experience in Colorado and what you've been seeing. Sure. No, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Mark. And I think it's important to note that when we're here in Colorado, at least through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, when we're talking cannabis, we're really speaking to hemp specifically. Um, our marijuana industry is overseen by our State Department of Re Revenue and our Marijuana Enforcement Division. In Colorado, um, as I indicated, we oversee the, the hemp sector in my division. Um, we adopted regulations two years ago. We incorporated by reference the, the Code of Federal Regulations for Food for Human Consumption, Part 117 of the CFR and Part 111, which is for dietary supplements. 
We incorporated all of that and that, that provides a good framework of regulatory oversight, but there's obviously uniquenesses within the hemp sector that we um, develop hemp specific kind of additional um, um, requirements um, in um, last year, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2019, specific to that. That said, the provisions of um, our act and of the CFR allows for embargo of product when we come across product that doesn't meet the regulatory standards is the easiest and most general way to say it. And we consider that to be an adulterated product. What can cause an adulterated, adulterated product and what we're seeing a ingredients from unapproved sources, that could be the hemp itself. Hemp that didn't test compliant with the 0.3% um, threshold requirement. It could be um, another raw ingredient from a hemp producer in another state that doesn't have an analogous food regulatory program. So it's um, that product is being manufactured in another state outside of the, the regulatory purview of uh, um, the agency. It could also be operational controls that impart bacteriological, chemical, or physical hazards onto the finished product, or as general as the finished product or any of the ingredients being stored in a condition whereby it may be contaminated. If you had a product that required refrigeration and it wasn't held under refrigeration controls, or you had a product that had some stability requirements and it wasn't being held under that, those could all be um, specific instances with, when we would embargo the product. Embargoed product typically is um, not tested for then further compliance. We've made a determination that the conditions it was held in um, were unsafe and the product would need to be condemned. The um, agent or the facility could make a petition to us to indicate why they think they can potentially test their way out of it. A lot of times that's not a viable option for the, the facility because all product um, might have to be tested in that case, but we are open to um, different sort of ways to remediate that. Some of it is just reprocessing the product and that's always a good way to get um, embargoed product into out of our embargoed state and into commerce. Another issue that we have been seeing quite a bit of is misbranded product. We have specific labeling requirements in Colorado for hemp infused products that requires disclosure of the amount of THC in milligrams in the product. And also if um, other cannabinoids are isolated, the amount in milligrams that are contained in those products. If the, the label is um, not truth in labeling, we will take action on that. Specifically, um, the THC and the levels of THC are our biggest concern. We obviously have a, a um, well-branded, well-regulated marijuana industry in Colorado and we don't want to create diversion or undermine our marijuana industry by allowing hemp products that really more mimic marijuana products uh, within the hemp space. So that's kind of how we manage the embargo aspect on the food specific products in Colorado. Hand it back to Michelle for passing off to Lou. Thank you, appreciate that um, perspective. And Lou, I guess speaking of perspective, um, and we just heard from you know the state regulatory agency and you as kind of the state, I don't even know how you characterize yourself, chief law enforcement officer for <laughs> chief attorney that uh, you know lays down the hammer. So you know if one of these issues do come up from the state agency, I guess what happens next? How does it end up with you? You know, obviously goal to avoid anything on your desk for any of our clients or any of the operators in this space. But I think it'd be really helpful to hear you know, soup to nuts, how the process works, um, you know, from, oops, I should have gotten that permit, or oops, I didn't know I was supposed to um, not pour that down the drain to something before you. Yeah, I'll, let me try, I'll try to give a, a, um, an explanation of the sort of spectrum of how things happen procedurally from, from an enforcement standpoint, um, using Massachusetts as an example. Um, my office, the Attorney General's office, works sort of hand in hand with the various environmental agencies in Massachusetts who typically start the investigations and the enforcement matters. Um, Department of Environmental Protection in Massachusetts is the biggest agency, but there are others like Fish and Wildlife and Agriculture and things like that. Um, but uh, it, these cases often start, these enforcements often start with investigations and calls to and by the uh, environmental agencies like the Department of Environmental Protection. And at the sort of investigation uh, step of the process, um, DEP, for example, is actively looking for information. There might be inspections. There might be um, 
uh, letters and forms going out to um, to companies asking for information, asking for documents, and sort of ordering uh, companies to respond to those requests. Um, there could be a notice of enforcement conference where they call a company to come in and meet with them. Um, and those could result in uh, notices of non-compliance, either in hand on site during inspection or, or at those meetings or in the mail afterwards, which are basically documents saying these are the these are the regulations or laws we think that you violated from the agency's point of view. Um, so that's sort of the, the first step, the investigation piece of it. Um, and um, it could go on from there to escalate into higher level enforcement, depending on what the agency finds. Um, the next step after that would probably be uh, something like an administrative order um, and a penalty or a penalty. Um, and that could be uh, a, a unilateral order that the agency issues on its own, or um, it, there could be conversations between the company and the agency to result in some kind of resolution for whatever the violation might be. And that could be in some kind of consent order. Um, so, so those are typically how a situation would resolve after an investigation, assuming there's evidence found of a violation at the administrative level. But um, sometimes it would go beyond that. And that's where my office comes in. Um, we meet regularly with the Department of Environmental Protection, talk about um, referring cases to us for further prosecution uh, in, in the judicial system, in the courts, as opposed to at the agency. Um, and I'd say that cases that come to our office um, typically have some kind of administrative action first. There, there's usually been some contact between the agency and the, um, the potential defendant um, beforehand, um, although not in every single case. Um, if they come to us, one, one frequent reason might be that there's been administrative action and it hasn't resolved the problem, either because the companies haven't responded well to the agency or just because there's continued noncompliance um, after, after some previous administrative action. Um, sometimes if uh, the, the potential harm for a violation is significant enough, something might come directly to our office. Um, or if there's a situation where there's an ongoing violation that, uh, that um, the agency believes the, you know, can't be stopped by agreement, that they need a court order, like a, a restraining order or an injunction or an attachment, um, that could be another reason something comes directly to us. But for whatever the reason, um, th there's no there's no specific hard cut rules for how a case comes to us uh, in Massachusetts. That we can agree amongst ourselves how to deploy our resources to do that. We can bring our cases separately. I believe there are other states that, depending on the circumstances, may have more hard and fast rules when um, an attorney general's office can be uh, involved, uh, whether it has to be after an agency action or not. Um, and uh, in those instances, when it comes to us, then the, the next step would be that the, the company would probably hear from us. We have, a, we have a policy of reaching out to companies where possible and informing them that we're considering bringing a case and um, having a conversation if, if, uh, if a potential defendant wants to about the matter, about their side of the story and about whether or not there can be an agreed upon resolution here. I think we think that makes sense from a resources standpoint, from a practical solution standpoint. And, and we've, we've done that for decades now uh, in Massachusetts anyway. Um, and, and my sense is across the board, whether it's at an agency or at an attorney general's office, I think the, the, the rule as opposed to the exception would be uh, willingness to have a conversation unless there was some particularly serious life-threatening uh, situation happening to see if there could be some resolution ahead of time. But um, that is, that's the general spectrum of how things can go from, uh, from the administrative standpoint, administrative investigation up through a referral to our office and then you know, the ultimate would be the, 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 the prosecution of the case, the filing of a complaint, the prosecution of the case with our office. I don't know, if Michelle, if you want me to move on to the, another topic after that or specific question, or that that's at least the general initial piece. Yeah, that's extremely helpful. And I don't know, Jeff, if there's anything you can offer from the Colorado perspective, um, you know, is it similar of how yeah. things might progress from yeah, you and your attorney general's office? Yeah, very similar. I think um, a, a slight nuance to Colorado is, um, as you heard Mark and Lou talking about different states' um, configuration of whom acts as like the EPA arm of the state, the environmental protection arm. That's our agency, the Department of Public Health and Environment. So we have an air division, a water division, my division, and a hazardous materials waste management division. A hemp or cannabis um, operation may see um, permits, registrations, licenses from all four divisions. For us, they get a registration to produce um, the hemp infused product. They could also be um, permitted through our air division for the use of VOCs, as Mark talked about earlier. 
and they could also have a um, national pollution um, discharge elimination systems permit from our water division. So they could have a number of different interactions with our folks. Um, that means each of those and those arms of our government would be at the facility doing some sort of analysis or reviewing reports submitted by the facility. Um, the other divisions within our department acts really as, as Lou just described in Massachusetts. They might have um, an investigatory finding, do an administrative action, come to some um, enforcement um, agreement, either unilateral or on consent um, through the AG. Not many of those progress into a criminal um, activity. Our division, on the other hand, um, because when we're talking about the hemp sector, there's that fine line between it being potentially a hemp compliant product and actually a marijuana product. Um, and the, the concerns that our state has right now at this time of potential diversion of hemp products into um, the marijuana industry, as I mentioned before, or undermining the marijuana industry with um, um, that um, hemp products um, that really more mimic marijuana. Uh, there could be the pursuit of criminal activities because of that through ourselves that we would um, provide to our Colorado Bureau of Investigations and our Marijuana Enforcement Division for further action and investiga investigation on. They, dependent on their findings, may go to criminal action through their Attorney General's office. Great, that's very helpful to hear. And obviously, you know, depending on where our listeners are, where our viewers are, you know, you certainly want to make yourself familiar with who, who, what agency and who you'd be dealing with um, and who the players are in your state. You know, make yourself familiar in the sense of not only complying with the law, but who are the players. And I think that's a good segue back to Lou. So you, what happens if you receive a warning letter or violation, a notice? I mean, if, if something's gone wrong and you have something you receive something in your mail or an email from, you know, official state correspondence. What what's your first reaction? Who should you call? What should you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're getting a notice from the state, typically from the the Department of Environmental Protection, but perhaps from our office, if we send out a letter um, that that uh, that you weren't aware of, um, you know, I, I think they they almost always come with time limits. So I guess the first thing you should do is is make sure that you're complying with whatever time limits they give, just to to, to protect yourself or to protect your options. Um, even if that is a response back, I know um, in in my office, I may send out a letter that says, you know, we're intending to sue you, please get back to us within the next week. Um, you know, I certainly have people contact me and say, I, I'm looking for a lawyer right now, I got your letter, um, you know, we still would like to have a discussion with you, but I don't have my lawyer set yet or something like that. And, and as a general rule, we're, we're fine with that. Um, I think the, you know, making sure you get back to people um, within the time frames designated, I think is, is the number one most important thing, just to, you know, let people know that you're listening, you want to have a conversation, not to take action without having heard from you. And I think most of the time, unless there's some pressing issue, um, people are willing to, to, to work with you to, to do things like get a lawyer, if that's the next step for you, if you want to have um, professional um, advice on this. Um, and this is one of those situations where, you know, of course, nobody has to get a lawyer, um, in these situations, but uh, you know, it's it's the usual question of do you do you want to try and DIY this yourself, or do you want to get expert advice on a subject, you know, from people that have that have experience in in what the potential outcomes could be and how the process is. And so, so I think those are the the beginning steps: of responding, deciding if you if you want to have a counsel, and um, also uh, you know, to the extent there is some substantive thing that has to happen at your property, you know. Is are you being asked to stop doing a thing that's being told is illegal? Can you do that within the time frame? Um, you know, different cases may require different answers, but I think that from an enforcement standpoint, you know, usually before I talk to someone, I want to know if they've at least stopped the illegal activity for the time being, so we have uh, we have a conversation. I don't have to worry about running into court to try and force them to stop it. I think those are the beginning steps. Great, and I know we're taking this in reverse order. We talked about the overview and then talked about the warning letter. We're going to take one step back, and start at the very beginning. You know, you as an operator, um, you know, licensed business, whatever that business is, whatever that license is, do you have a requirement to let, you know, a state, you know, DEP or food inspector or, you know, federal EPA, do they have a right to walk onto your property? You know, what what does that interaction look like if you get the knock on the door, you know, and you weren't weren't scheduled for a regular inspection, you know, if you could talk a little bit about it from the state's perspective, um, about letting, letting someone like Jeff onto your property. Sure. 
Sure. Um, I, I, you know, the, the unsatisfying answer is it depends on the law that's at issue. Way to be um, a lawyer. Right. How to play that lawyer depends. It could, could it be any other answer? Um, but no, of, of course it does. And, and it may depend. So some statutes, like in Massachusetts, um, uh, the, the state version of the Superfund law in Massachusetts, Chapter 21E, um, has provisions in its regulations that allow DEP to come on site um, with reasonable notice to, uh, to um, investigate violations. Whereas, you know, other statutes like, for example, wetlands protection, I, I believe, is one where there's no specific provision in there that allows for direct access on a property to look for a violation right off the bat. Now, having said that, you know, I think almost all the time, DEP, for example, wants to get, you know, agreement by the parties to go do an inspection by agreement, unless unless there's some critical reason why they can't. And so they always try to get agreement from the, the parties, in my experience, to, 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 to do a uh, inspection on site. And in my experience, in the vast majority of times, people are okay with that. Um, they may want to come with them. They want to have their attorney come. But, um, you know, typically that's something that's not really a huge battle for people. Um, if it does come down to that, there certainly have been cases where people don't want to let people on the property and there isn't an explicit um, statutory or regulatory rule that allows DEP to just come on anyway and push the issue. Um, DEP can almost always go get an, a warrant to come on the property if they feel like it's worth it. Um, and I've certainly seen that happen in cases. And, you know, then from an enforcement standpoint, you're thinking about, OK, do I have to leave somebody at the front gate of this facility to make sure they don't truck out the illegal stuff while we go to court and get the warrant come back, which is certainly things we think about in, in trying to figure out um, how to resolve a warrant situation. But, you know, if, if agencies feel like they have to, they can press the issue. And there's usually some administrative process that would allow them to, to come on site. But, you know, again, it, it may depend on the particular statute. It also may depend on if you've had past enforcement. If you've got an outstanding consent decree or consent judgment with the uh, with a state or a commonwealth or an agency, there may be provisions in there that say they have access under certain conditions automatically. Um, we certainly have those in our consent judgments uh, from time to time. So um, all, all those things could factor in. You just have to be aware of what your current situation is and you have to be aware of what laws you're operating under. Right. And certainly under some, you know, cannabis specific licenses and all of that, you know, you might have agency cooperation. So maybe one state agency has the right to come on um, and then might notify another a sister agency, brother agency, whatever we call it, um, to have that right to come on and work cooperatively um, with joint agencies. But that's, I think, extremely helpful to know. Typically, it's not, you know, that surprise knock on your door. Typically, it's the email or correspondence to arrange a date. Um, so you have some forewarning. That's very helpful. And just to clarify, warrant, um, as you were speaking to it, you mean court ordered um, warrant. Right, right. If, if they can't if they can't get on pursuant to an automatic right under a law, they can usually go to a judge or a tribunal of some kind and get the sign off in that fashion to require. Okay. Just wanted to translate the legalese there for a minute. All right. Um, I really appreciate that over you. I'm going to ask Mark and Jeff to come back on. Hopefully you're not too nauseous with our popping on, popping off. Um, but we thought before we get to questions, which we'll definitely leave time for if there are any, we wanted to just kind of, you saw the overview of what is EHS, what are some enforcement actions, you know, how from the state's perspective, you know, did these operators end up there? So we wanted to just kind of discuss some tips and tricks um, from those that have seen it in the field, you know, all, from all four of us, some lessons learned and some advice that we can offer to cannabis operators in the space um, and how to make sure you're not in the hot seat. And, you know, a year from now, we're not talking about your case and another enforcement webinar. So I'll start things off. Um, and my first point of view, both from my, you know, public sector experience, as well as now, you know, private, just cooperate um, would be the word I would use. And so, you know, as Lou talked about warrants and having to go to court, you know, if if an agency is asking you for something and you're not providing whatever that something is, whether it's access to your property or information, you're starting off on, um, you know, a certain type of foot that might lead you down a path um, and not a positive path. So, you know, really realizing, as Lisa, said, most, uh, most perspective from the state is willing to cooperate and and work with you. But that also means you yourself as the operator are willing to cooperate. And I'm not saying throw open your doors anytime anyone asks, you know, certainly double check that they have the right to come on and double check and limit the scope of what they're asking. Don't give them 100 documents if really it could be satisfied with five, but really being open to working with the state and cooperating um, with them and all their requests and hitting hitting the deadlines and all the letters. So that would be 
my piece of advice, cooperate. I'm going to hand it to Mark. Um, if you've got any thoughts from your years in this industry of how to avoid landed in the hot seat. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. A having been on the enforcement side and the regulator side um, and asking for people to be, oh, sorry about that, asking for people to be put in jail for not complying with the court order. And then also having been on the private sector side, being on site when the guys come, guys and gals come in with badges and guns from the FBI and the EPA, I can tell you that the number one thing you want to be with regulators is transparent. Um, if you have a spill on your property, or if you've got some waste that's been piling up beyond the um, regulatory limit in terms of quantity or date, you want to reach out to your regulators. You want to be transparent with them for a number of reasons. Um, number one, it could be a mitigating factor if there are violations found that you are open and honest and transparent with them. Uh, number two, it, it almost, in a lot of cases, could remove the, any kind of criminal intent. Um, not all the time. I don't want to, it obviously depends on the situation, uh, but to the extent that you are forthcoming with regard to violations that you know are taking place on your property, uh, perhaps you're discharging without a permit, or you again had a spill, some kind of waste violation, just reach out to your regulators. Find out what you need to do to get into compliance. They appreciate that, and uh, it will serve you better in the long term. Great, thank you. Um and then Jeff, any any advice here for the operators? It really goes down the same lines that you and Mark just said, you know, whether, however you say it, be, be cooperative, be transparent. I think it really probably rings true though within this industry, the hemp industry is a novel industry. Um, we fully um, acknowledge as regulators, we lag behind the industry and the understanding of what's going on. Um, the education is both ways. Um, we really we can educate you on the, the regulatory needs and the compliance needs of your operation and how to achieve that. And you can talk to us about where you're trying to go and how you're trying to be um, more efficient and, and more productive and more profitable within your sector and what operational changes you would like to seek to, to do that. We're always open to have those conversations because we have the same goal, a safe product being out there that's compliant that doesn't have impact to consumers or environment. So it's a shared goal um, that never changes. And I think the best thing about asking about that, you know, um, permission up front is I think we all probably remember about 12 years ago, an unfortunate instance in um, Southeast Colorado where um, a cantaloupe grower created um, a listeria contamination. There was no nefarious ill intent there. It was an operational change that created catastrophic um, impacts. You know, 30 plus people died from that. Again, nothing that was um, thought of in a negative way. They thought it was the best thing they should do for their operation. That call never came to us. If it would have come to us, we would have said, no, don't do this. Here's another way you can look at look at doing what or achieving what you're trying to do. That's not armchair quarterback, and that would have been the discussion. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. So we'd always encourage people, as Mark said, pick up the phone, have a call, and we'll do our best to help you out. Great, thanks. And Lou, anything that hadn't been said, um, anything you'd like to add here? I, mean, I think you're hearing variations on a theme. I think it's definitely, you know, the, the the working with an agency and being willing to have a conversation with the agency to, act, you know, even before you take an action to check in with them. I think those are all right from my point of view. I think agencies have a ton of discretion um, and they're willing to have that discussion. And I think a lot of times agencies are thinking about, you know, is this person taking this seriously? Even if they come in and say they don't think they did something wrong or they're honestly confused, they made a mistake here. Um, you know, an agency may be willing to have a discussion about that if they're if they if they feel comfortable that the the, the party feels like they uh, understand the problem and that they're going to respect the regulations going forward. I, I think agencies care a lot about that, and that and you can have that discussion that they can use their discretion in a way that maybe achieves a practical result for everybody. All right, and we are freakishly on time, so I appreciate that. So we left the 15 minutes for questions, and it looks like we had a couple pop in. Although I will say. Um, those asking questions do not attach a state to their question, so it's a little difficult to answer, but I will open this one up. It's pretty specific, but I think we can we can broaden the question. So a question came in, um, what's the easiest way to identify whether or not a company has attained a Title V Clean Air Act 
permit. And I guess this asking the broader question, you know, what what information is available online, both permitting and regulations? You know, where can operators go who heard us today and said, oh, my God, I need to check if I, what I'm doing is correct? What resources would you point people to? And maybe I can kick that to you, Jeff and Lou, um, from the state perspective, what's online? I mean, I just the internet, I assume everything is, but um, you know, if you could talk about that, it'd be really helpful. So in, in Colorado, we have a comprehensive list of permittees online for the different sectors we're talking about, air, water, or has. Um, if um, the gentleman um, who asked that question is from Colorado, um, my email's um, gonna be on the last slide. Make sure you send, send that to me and I'll get you a direct link, but you can go to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment website, um, go to the, um, air permitting section and look there. If that doesn't um, satisfy you, shoot me an email and I'll get you in direct contact um, with the, the folks who oversee those permits so you can get your question directly answered. Yeah, and I think uh, on the Massachusetts side, uh, again, a lot of this stuff is online. Certainly, uh, Michelle mentioned regulations and rules. Um, most agencies have their regulations online. Certainly, the Department of Environmental Protection has their website split up by media, you know, as in like hot solid waste, hazardous waste, air, water, and you can see the regulations there. Some agencies have permits online. I'll note in Massachusetts, the uh, the the um, Executive Office of Energy Environmental Affairs, that's the, the highest level secretariat for all energy environmental stuff in Massachusetts, it has an online um, dashboard. If you search something like environmental dashboard in Massachusetts, and you can search for things like permits and um, and enforcement actions and things like that. And it's, it's, um, it's got a fairly extensive list there, for example. Great. And I, I would just make the plug um, for any of them who are watching and listening. So licensed environmental uh, professionals in your state. So there are um, consultants and other and environmental engineers and others who do have resources and there are other databases out there. So if you're not able to find it yourself, there are a number of professionals um, who are, are used to doing environmental site assessments and can look up your property, you as an operator, or help navigate the system in addition to, uh, you know, environmental attorneys. So just want to make that plug for environmental professionals that are typically licensed um, in their individual state. And then Looks like we have another question that came in, and it's pretty oh, specific. Michelle, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Mark. Before you leave that, um, related to that, um, and that's public information that's available online, not necessarily permits or licenses, but oftentimes compliance information is available online as well. So if there are entities in your community that have it out for you as an operator, I, I know it's hard to believe some people don't like cannabis, um, but if they want to find out if you have licensing or if you've had a compliance issue, they can also search those state online and federal online databases with regard to compliance issues. So just wanted to add that as a footnote. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Valuable advice there. Um, and then, you know, just jump into another question. It's about um, what type of wastewater can and can't go down a public treatment works and specifically tied to cannabis. I'd say in this one, maybe follow up. Um, follow up with Mark and I separately and we can get into some details there, but I'd say kind of holistically, a lot of the environmental regulations aren't specifically addressing cannabis in most states. That's not to say you should not be complying and that you're not required to comply, but it's not necessarily getting down to the nuances of the analytes, the particulates um, specific to cannabis. So you'd have to just make sure, um, you know, you are complying with the general, the theme and just even if you're doing a word search for the word cannabis or THC um, or whatever it is that might not pop up in the regulations. So don't uh, don't take away from this to mean you don't need to comply. But if you're looking for, um, you know, what specifically related to cannabis uh, residual solvents or anything like that, you might not see that um, in state specific environmental regulations. But I'd say adding to the caveat, you might not see that yet. Um, we are seeing a number of states that are integrating um, with their cannabis and environmental regulations and really syncing them up. Um, all right. I Right now, I don't see any other questions coming in. Feel free to pop them in the chat if you do have any questions. Um, and you do have our contact information right here on the slide. And so if there are any specific burning questions or any follow-up from today's webinar, definitely feel free to shoot any one of us or all of us if you're not sure who the right person is or what state you're asking about. Um, shoot us some information about you and we'd be happy to try to direct you to the right resource or the right person if we're not the right person. 
Um, and I just want to say on behalf of YES and the EHS practice group, thank you for tuning in. This is one in a series of webinars, um, probably hold until the new year, but please do look out um, in your email for future webinars on this topic. And really huge thanks to Jeff and Lou from taking time away from their busy schedule to join us. Really appreciate the state's perspective um, and you know, hope to never see you across the table in any sort of enforcement action, but those faces are so friendly, I wouldn't mind it. Um, but really, really do appreciate your time today and everyone who tuned in and listened. And if you really want to watch this again, it'll be up on YouTube um, for all your busy Friday night activities. You can watch it 